Hey, this is Jose Galison of No Way Jose on the Liberty Movement YouTube channel. Today, my guest is Sal Mayweather, aka Sal the Agorist. Um, basically, he's known as being a meme lord. It's kind of how I introduced him. Uh, and he's, he's a man of many coats, uh, or whatever the hell the saying is. I seem to have a knack for like fucking up sayings. I've been noticing a lot of episodes. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, you get the idea. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he's a. Uh, I'm going to allow Sal here in a second to give a quick intro for himself, but like a real quick one, just kind of a condensed one. Cause what we're doing here today is I want to just do an episode on him. I've been doing a lot of these lately and it, this kind of came from something Vin said where he, he was kind of talking about his whole idea of magic. And one thing he brought up and it kind of like really clicked with me is like, we like to think that we come to positions through logic. And he says like, even something like one good example for me is actually I have two good examples is like, for example, my, tra my transition from minarchist to anarchist, and from anarchist to agorist, we're both like they, in, a, in, a, in a sense, they're like, oh, I read a book, and then now I uh, see myself this way. But in reality, like the ad anatomy of the state is what made me an anarchist. It was Dave Smith that, that got me to read that. So it was like the magic of him, you know, is what brought me to that. And then with agorism, it was Pete Quinones. So there's something to that. I think it's, I think it helps to get to know someone before you get their message. And I think that was something to that. Like I kind of found myself identifying with them. Or, or relating to them or feeling like as nerdy as it may say, like I kind of had a relationship with them in a, in a, in a way. I know that sounds like very simpy, you know, but, <laughs> like, but you know, I felt like there was kind of a magic of personality there. And that's kind of what brought me to that. So I, I've been trying to do some of these episodes with certain people, especially people I see myself being able to have multiple episodes with. Um, I want to do these and kind of just do an episode on them and just, you know, their life's journey and stuff like that. I mean, if any of you guys have seen my Vin episode, uh, we, we did the same exact thing. And, uh, yeah, if you haven't go check it out, we went completely into his, like basically his whole bio from a, from a little kid. It was a fun episode. Uh, with that, Sal, you want to go ahead and give a quick intro for yourself? Just a super condensed one since the whole episode is an intro of you basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so I'm, I'm an agorist and, and, and anarchist activist. And, uh, that's sort of my whole mission in life is to promote agorism and counter economics to the best way possible. Uh, and that's that's probably the, the shortest way I could describe it. All right. Well, that's short and sweet. Can't do much better than that. <laughs> uh, with that, uh, let's uh, let's start out with um, we're going to do where and when you were born. Like where, where and when were you born? We'll start out from the beginning. You know, I mean, um, I'm, I'm from originally from Jersey. Uh, I grew up about 15 minutes outside of lower Manhattan. And I lived there for most of my life. Um uh, I'm 34, 33. I'm about to be 34, and uh, I just moved to Florida a few months ago to get out to get away from uh, Fidel Murphy and Emperor Cuomo and the totalitarian martial law that they were instituting in the Northeast. So I came down here where there's no income tax. There's pretty good gun laws if, if there is such a thing. Uh, and I don't have to worry about 3D printing laws. So it's sort of, I'm in a much better position here. It's also a much cheaper cost of living. So that's basically it. Yeah, born and raised right outside New York. I grew up there and now um, I'm a refugee from the Northern slave states. You know, people used to escape the Southern slave states into the North and now we escape the Northern slave states into the South. It's funny how we reverses, you know. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I'm actually here in Florida as well. I live in the, I'm like an hour, 45 minutes just ish away from the Tampa area, from Tampa. So I'm in that general. Oh, where are you? Uh, Tampa area. I'm in a kind of Apollo Beach, Riverview, uh, Ruskin kind of area. I don't know if you know any of those places yet. You haven't been here long. So yeah. Yeah, no, no, I don't know. Any, I'm, I parked in St. Pete and this is where I'm at. It's yeah. the only place I know is my local oh, area. So. Like St. Pete, then yeah, I'm, I'm, then yeah, we're, I, I, I work in Tampa. So I'm like, yeah, I'm like 45 minutes away. From oh, me. we're neighbors. <laughs> we're neighbors, bro. Yeah. So cool. St. Pete, I, that was another question I was going to get into earlier, but I guess we kind of jumped the gun. I was going to ask uh, if you kind of went rural because I live out, I mean, you kind of get outside of Tampa, you can kind of get more into the country a little bit. And that's where I'm at. I mean, not country, country. I have I have like a wilderness preserve that's like my tree line behind me. So acres and acres. And I have cool. about two acres where I'm at. But, you know, I mean, being 45 minutes outside of a major city, that's that's, that's, that's not bad. You know, so right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm more of like an urban guy. I've never really yeah. been in a rural setting. Like I don't really know about the country and stuff like that. 
uh, but I'm not opposed to it. You know, if you if you think about it, really, agorists sort of go one of two ways, right? Everyone sort of does either the rural, like like uh, you know, homesteading, dirt in the fingernail sort of lifestyle, or they go the other route and they become like this sort of digital nomad uh, sort of lifestyle. And I don't I don't know. I'd, I'd almost prefer to do both. So I figure I'm young enough to sort of move around now, and when I get older, maybe I'll you know do the whole homesteading style uh, agorist lifestyle so we'll see what happens yeah i mean i'm definitely in the in between it's like yeah you are right it's usually one extreme or the other but i'm kind of not like i mean i have two acres so it's not like i'm definitely not homesteading but i i'm in that spot where i'm kind of like in a good mix where i'm close enough to civilization and i'm like in a, in a shit hits a fan type scenario i have enough land where i like and i'm like against the woods so and i got running right, water yeah. and, you know stream behind me all that so eh, that's nice but i'm still like near civilization it's kind of a happy medium but I mean, it would be nice. Yeah, I'm that. not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if shit hits the fan that Florida is going to be too too destroyed. I, I, I mean, I think that it'll affect probably the whole world, but Florida is probably going to do better than most of the country. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one thing I've gone in a couple of these. I kind of like when all this stuff started off. I really hit the black pill really hard. But then, like honestly, the funny thing is the black pill kind of prepared me in a way because it kind of let me let me get a little bit more prepared. And now, like, in, in a weird way, now I'm kind of, like, white-pilled because it's, like, especially with discovering agorism, it's kind of, like, you know, you learn that the people who, you know, prepare are the ones who thrive. <laughs> like, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So it's, yeah, it's not, yeah, definitely. Because you know, people think it would collapse, and they, and they hear words like shit hit the fan, but it's that's a, just a simplistic way of putting it. It's, like, it'll hit the fan for some people. <laughs> like, Yeah. Yeah, no, I think you hit the nail on the head too. Because the people who prepare today, those those people will be sort of the the, the landed nobility of, of the future. You know that like that will be the next generation's uh, upper class. You know, so that's why it's so important to like do things like you know buy uh, precious metals and, and cryptocurrencies and stuff like that. So yeah. Super cool. I didn't realize. I assumed Florida. You were probably like I don't know, in the Panhandle, or I don't know, just a million other places. Didn't realize you were, you know, basically right next door. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I parked here. I've been thinking about setting up like a Freedom Cell or a Bitcoin Cash Meetup mm -hmm. or something like that. So if I do, I'll, I'll, I'll you know, keep in touch. Maybe you can help me out or something. Find yeah, some for people sure. in the we local have, area. Yeah, we uh, we've had I think one meeting we did. Uh, uh, it's because I mean, this is part of the Liberty Movement YouTube channel. I think you're in that in the group. We had the Liberty Movement. We kind of had more steam at the beginning. We're still trying to do it like during the the, the like the lockdown. That's kind of everybody was on social media. So we got a got a good headwind there. And we uh, one of the only we have a few chapters set up. And one of the chapters set up was uh, the Florida. We have the Florida chapter and then we have sub chapters, the Tampa cha uh, sub chapter. And we've already we already had one meetup. We hung out, had some beers and stuff, and so that was fun. So cool. if we ever do that again, I'll, I'll definitely let you know. So that'd be cool. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, For sure. I mean, it was just a get together, but that's kind of the idea of the Liberty Movement. It was like the whole idea is to be cultural and non-political. So like, and like, and a lot of people like freak out. Like, what does that even mean? Because everybody wants to, everyone <laughs> wants to engage in some sort of you know action, and the only action they know is political generally. So it's like. And we try to take a neutral stance where it's like, I mean, I have my own opinions, but where it's like, if you want to do that, whatever. But like, I mean, as, as, as the movement as a group, we kind of take like that neutral stance, but it's like, we're kind of like, we're more just trying to be like, Hey, you know, like even simple stuff, like, you know, having like get togethers, like drinking beers and stuff like that. I mean, honestly, like not to get political, that does far more than da damn near any political thing you're ever going to do is. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, they said the American revolution was started in pubs and taverns, mm -hmm. right? So yeah so maybe, uh, maybe the next one will as well yeah so that's cool uh, i'll definitely uh yeah we already have shirts too like we already got a merch so i'll have to send you one we uh we no took shit, a freaking, yeah. the florida flag and kind of made, went a little subversive with it and then we kind of put the end cap thing behind it so it's kind of like over like so there's shirts and everything he's got tank tops t-shirts very cool very yeah. cool <laughs> i'll show awesome. you'll probably do yeah. it yeah uh, yeah, absolutely. It's funny. A lot of people, when we started doing flags, because that's kind of what we did for a lot of chapters, we did flags. And a lot of people were kind of like, why would you do that? Because it's like status. But it's like, well, no, you're kind of like subverting the status aspect of it, kind of. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. It's just a piece of cloth. It is whatever you make it, right? Yeah. So, all right, to go back to where we were at, I want to know your, probably your earliest memories from childhood. Because, like, one thing I brought up with Van is, like, for me, I think that can, like, mean a lot. For some people, it doesn't mean a lot. For some people, it does. Like, I told Van... I have no problem going over it because I've been, it's been a long time. Like one of some of my earliest memories is my mother getting beaten as a child. So like that affected me a lot growing up. And so a lot of times people's earliest memories are stuff that kind of 
form them as a human being. So like me, mm -hmm. like I have two daughters, a wife, I'm kind of, you know, so I've always taken the protector role very seriously as a result of that, you know? So yeah. So I'll, I'll stop rambling and let you go on now. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, you know, it's funny you say it too, because it's interesting. One of the, you know, I was born in what, 87. So it was, I, I remember right outside my window, we had like this home heating oil tank. Uh, and I can remember this, this was like Gulf War One. This was Bush Sr. at the time. I can remember thinking I was like, you know, what, three, four years old, something like that. I can remember thinking like, Saddam Hussein and George Bush are going to meet up and they're going to have like a big fight because Saddam Hussein wants to come take the oil in this tank. And I can remember thinking like, like that was what that was what they were going to do. And it's funny because, you know, you, you know, you grow up and you learn that that's not the way it works. But eventually here I am 34 years later and I'm like, well, that is the way it should work. Right. Saddam Hussein and George Bush should meet in a field and fight each other instead of sending other people's children to go do it for them. They should go fight in the field. So. Yeah, you know, it's ironic. My my three or four year old self was more keen on foreign policy than most U.S. diplomats and you know members of the state uh, State Department. So uh, that was one of the first really memories that I can think of in terms of like that, that really shaped me like politically. I also remember like asking my parents about abortion and stuff like that. I was sort of like, wow, they let people do that. Like that's sort of crazy. And you know my, my opinions on abortion of you know this was you know I was like you know five years old I've been for and against it and for and against it and stuff like that so but those are just a couple of the main uh, you know things I can think of that come to the top of my head. It's funny. It's like because it, it kind of does hold true that it is like kind of formed you because as silly as that that anecdote was, it, it you could kind of see how that formed you as an adult. It's like I mean obviously right, mine right. was a little bit darker than yours, but you know whatever same same effect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, all right, so tell me about young young Sal, little Sal, like probably like you know pre high school, pre middle school. What, what was what was life like for you then? I, you know, I was honestly I was always like a like a super nerd. I was like really like into politics and philosophy and like it sounds crazy, but I was that reading is? like Plato and stuff. <laughs> yeah, it really was. It was crazy, and it's sort of that is really probably what shaped my me the most was like that whole like I went through this whole like reading Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and like all these different philosophers like heavily for like two or three years at a very young age. And that really gave me like an appreciation for logic, right? That's what really let me see the power of logic. And then I went to college and I took classes in logic and I studied under uh, some really well-known logicians and I sort of was able to hone my skills. And I think that's sort of what helped me um, identify agorism as being so powerful because it was the log it, it is the logical consistency of agorism that makes it so powerful that's what gives counter economics its strength is the logical consistency and i think a lot of that in my formative years helped me sort of spot it when i when i saw it later on when i saw it in the wild you know yeah that's, that's funny I, i'm a little bit jealous there because i i wish i had kind of gotten that base of like logic because i didn't think I don't think I really got well trained in logic until I was like a young adult because it was, it was honestly probably more of my religious, like I went from, you know, it was kind of a big deal for me going from being religious to being what I consider an atheist. And a lot of people in the weeds, I'm an agnostic atheist. I don't assert that there is no God. I just claim I don't know. And that seems to be the only logical position for me personally. But uh, anyways, like going through that and exploring that, that is kind of because like, I really dive deep in that. Because even when I went first, I went, went that way. My family would always like kind of like, you know, be like, well, what about this or what about that? And so like, well, in a sense, I kind of didn't really care what they had to say. It was like really irritating that it would always be framed like I was being an idiot. So I kind of had to go really deep and like learn the logic of a lot of that stuff and go into all that. And like going down that route really taught me about like fallacies and like how proper logic works. And it was just kind of like sad that like, I didn't learn that until I was a young adult. So it's like, it, I, I don't know. It's just one of those things that it's like, this should be fundamental to, to uh, education. And I was well, a nerd I, too. I read a ton. I just didn't ever, I was smart, but I what, didn't have that base of logic, you know? I, 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 th I think that that's part of the plan though. I think mm -hmm. that they don't want um, kids to learn logic. Like you're not supposed to be 12 years old and reading Plato. Like they don't want that. That's not good for them, right? Because then you will spot the logical consistency of agorism and you'll end up dedicating your life to subverting the state like me. So that's not what they want. Uh, they want people who can't see these things. You, know, you, you would never accept a scientific theory that isn't logically consistent. 
So why would you accept a political or economic theory that's logically inconsistent? But that's what so many people, millions and hundreds of millions of Americans do it every day, precisely because they're so poorly trained in logic. They're so ignorant of uh, formal and informal logic, you know, fallacies and all the stuff that you were talking about and so on. So I think that has a lot to do with it. It is. It's it's funny too because you can actually still be smart. But like I said, because like I was kind of nerd too at a young age. I I was like voracious reader. I just read all the time. All I did was read. But I didn't have that like I just more just I never really had that base of logic. So like you can be smart but not understand basic logic. And and the funny thing is, ironically, even in the atheist community, because I kind of like was sort of dabbled in that community, a lot of people have the same exact issue. They have all the logical like. All, know all the, the proper logical stuff and they're really smart a lot of them but it, they fall into the same trap of like statism and it's like they just replace one god for another essentially kind of deal <laughs> you know like that's a common trope of atheism and it's true and exactly that's exactly what they're doing and you know instead of some fictional god who they can at least pretend is benevolent they, you know they don't now they have to like you know pretend he's benevolent and they know it's in their face how, how evil and terrible they are so yeah even All right, let's move on. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Um, let's move on to uh, let's do like middle school, high school age. Like, what, what were we looking at with Sal there? Um, so at this point, I'm like, I'm, I'm sort of like a troublemaker at this point. I'm kind of getting into trouble now, and I'm sort of like uh, running in, having run ins with authority, like different like school teachers and cops and stuff like that. And um, it's, I'm basically rebelling at this point. Specifically, what age? I'm just curious because, like, for me, I didn't hit that spot until I was like 16. I mean, I did a little like little childhood silliness around like you know like eighth grade, but then I like got went real off the rails and drugs and all the sex and all that craziness around like 17. So I'm just kind of curious. It's always fun to hear like where people kind of went off the rails in that way. <laughs> um, I see like probably like uh, 16, 17, 18 okay. around there. Yeah, probably, probably about that age. I mean. I wasn't too crazy, you know, I I was just, you know, selling weed and, you know, just staying out late and partying and shit like that. Not reading Plato and Socrates and Aristotle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's funny. Did, did you find that being the spot where you kind of dropped off in your education as well? Because that's kind of like where I dropped off. Because like I said, I was a nerd as a kid, kind of got really into reading. And I kind of also like got and fell into like the jock thing where I kind of was big into sports in high school. And so then it was like kind of not cool to be smart in a way, you know, and like or be the – the one who reads all the time and the kind of same thing I had Mark Claire on yesterday it was the same thing with comics where it was like, I kind of like put that to the side and it's one of those things as you get older, you kind of stop fucking caring what people think. So like, I don't yeah, know. I mean, in a certain sense, but at the same time, like I was, I've always read, like I'll, I'll, I've always been a nerd. I don't care. Like they can, you know, that's just the way I've always been. Uh, yeah. And other than that, um, you know, I don't know. It's it's never really been a, a, like I've never really cared what other people have to think or say or do. So I've always just kind of gone my own route. And uh, reading is always like fundamental. That's sort of to me like that's like that's 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 sort of like uh, one of the main components of my life. Like people like enjoy music or art and stuff, and I'm like a huge bookworm. So that's sort of like uh, I'll, I would never give that up. You know. Yeah, I definitely, I regret big time. That's probably one of my biggest regrets is I didn't keep reading. And it wasn't entirely that I care what people think. A lot of it too was like I got really caught up in like drugs and chicks and, you know, trying to get ass and all that. So I was just more like my time was elsewhere. You know, if I had spare time, I was, you know, having fun. That yeah, too, but I, then I would go home and I would be like reading. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, wish, I wish I did that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause like, like I said, I didn't get back into reading until, cause I probably was reading up until like hardcore until like 12, 13, 14 kind of stopped. And it wasn't even until my early twenties that I really got back into it. And it's like, it's such a dead spot where it was like, God, it was just such a fucking waste. You know, it's like, I wasn't making anything of myself. <laughs> you know, it's really true what they say. I think it was Michael Malice who said public school is prison. And like, that's sort of, that was very true in my, in my experience. Like I was absolutely miserable in public school and my goal every day was to make the principal's life as much of a living hell as i possibly could and i think like i i i, I wasn't even supposed to graduate i think that they just kind of they didn't want to put up with me anymore so like they just pushed me out the door like my like you know you need a certain gpa or whatever it was and i was like you know 0. 0.86 or something i just stopped going to class at a certain point but then i got to college and you know you can study things you like so i I was a, a political science major and I was always interested in politics. 
And that's when I went from like, you know, 0.86 GPA in public high school to like a 4.0 at like a private uh, university. So it just goes to show you the difference, you know, when you, when you're passionate about something versus when you're a prisoner of the state. Yeah. I mean, I, I, that's nothing. I ended up going to college, but I tanked hardcore. Cause I think I, I think I was still more into that. Like, you know, the, the American dogma of like, I'm just supposed to like do what it's expected of me to some extent. Cause I went to just do like some generic, I, I don't remember. I, I think I went to be like a biology major, but it wasn't in which I kind of mildly enjoyed like looking back, like all the things that like I would have been interested in are the kind of stuff that like, I feel like people would be like, you're wasting your time. Cause I, I would have definitely enjoyed, you know, doing that. But I like, I just, in the end, I am just wasting a semester. I just blew it, you know, just friggin' was in a drunken uh, drug super for like, you know, a semester. And then I was just like, luckily I, I did well in high school. So I had a uh, all like scholarships. So it was like, you know, I didn't really actually have to pay for it, but I was like, if I kept going, I lost, I lost all my scholarships. So I was like, I'm going to have to pay for it. So it's like, nah, I'm gone. <laughs> but and that's enough. As soon as they send that bill, we'll see you later. Yeah, exactly. It's like, uh, you know, I guess that was a fun, fun little free ride, <laughs> but uh, I'm out. Yeah. But yeah, no, like I definitely wish I had just like, I'd gone that route, you know? But, well, well, that's but, sort of what, um, that, that's really not to like, jump the gun here, but that's sort of what really, uh, it really helped me sort of in the end in the long run because when I went to like college and like I sort of focused on political science and then I realized that by the time I, I got my you know, graduate degree and my master's degree that you know I have all these degrees in political science now and I've become a Rothbardian now and I, I realized I, I don't want to be uh, you know I don't want to take some job as a lobbyist or go work for some as a consultant for some congressman or somebody that I think should be in prison so uh, that's why I really decided to go the other route and start a podcast and a blog and, uh, you know, sort of be active on social media. I figured, you know, if I can't make a living doing uh, what I'm passionate about, the traditional route, well, then I'll, I'll sort of pave my own route. You know what I mean? So that's that's what I'm sort of doing uh, now. Yeah. And it's funny, too. I was just thinking while you're talking that I feel like the normal thing, you're, you're like expected to go certain routes in life. and like everyone has their things they really do like, you know, or are interested in. And a lot of times those are put down as like, you know, that's like the dumb thing. Don't do that. There's no future there. But in a weird way, I feel like I've become more educated now as an adult, just reading things I enjoy and, you know, going down those routes than the people who may have gone down the traditional, like what was expected of them, you know, say they went and got a nursing degree when they didn't really want to. And yeah, maybe they have a, they have a piece of paper behind their name, but it's like, it wasn't something they were passionate about. So it's like, they didn't really learn anything. It's like, whereas me, I'm in my, in my spare time, I'm reading like, I'm reading like, I don't know, Agoras Primer or, or something like that. You know, like this is stuff that I find to be fun. And so I'm like, these things are sticking more with me than they are with other people, you know? So I think there's something well, there the whole thing. If you're like, yeah, no, if you're, if you're, if you like something and you're passionate about it, you love it, like you'll pick it up quickly. But if you, if it's sort of like a drudge and you have to work at it, then, you know, it's sort of how I felt in high school versus how I felt in college, right? Like I had to push myself through, through high school. I, I barely did, but, but like college, I enjoyed reading those books. I was thankful when I got my syllabus because, uh, you know, here, here you have these like smart people telling you what books to read if you want to learn about politics. And I did. So, it, it, you know, some like I feel like today people go to school for that piece of paper for that for that degree. But like, I don't know. I, I that wasn't me. I, I really went to school for like the old school reason of getting an education, you know. And that sounds you're sort of cliche, but yeah. Hey, just two questions that I kind of want uh, to kind of maybe explain where you're at right now. Uh, where, what would you consider yourself at this time or at that time? You know, around that time of like uh, I don't know, like early college. Would you? And and also, did were you just kind of always a libertarian, or one of the, or are you one of those folks who kind of you know, because most people have their story of like came from the left or came from the right or whatever, you know, I mean, I think the political compass is broken, but, you know, colloquially speaking. So, right, right. Yeah. Um, I was always like this sort of constitutionalist sort of guy. And then uh, I didn't really, I was always libertarian, but I just didn't know it. And then Ron Paul came around. I can remember watching the debates and like all of the people on stage at the Republican debates that I was supposed to be you know the the standard candidates from the who, who exhibited the acceptable range of opinion they all looked like lunatics to me and the only one who really made any sense was ron paul and that was the guy who i was supposed to think was crazy so that really touched something off in my head i was like that's sort of odd let me look into this guy a little bit more and i sort of i started googling and next thing i know 
I found his economic advisors were uh, Peter Schiff and Walter Block. And because I was always active in, in political science, I knew that the libertarians were very like, they, they had their stuff down in terms of economics. So I wanted to know who Ron Paul's economic advisors were. And then I saw uh, the Peter Schiff was right videos and I saw Walter Block explaining these concepts in like an academic format in like on YouTube. And it sort of all just clicked for me. It was all, it was, it was like, you know, going back to the logical consistency, I was like, wow, this is much more consistent than anything else I've come across yet. And that's sort of, that's how I moved from constitutionalist to like, uh, you know, libertarian party, minarchist sort of, you know, small government kind of guy, like Justin Amash kind of dude. And like that, that that's where I was at about 2000 and I don't know if this was, I guess this was 2010, 11, 12, probably around there. So uh, would you say you came from, I mean, you said you're a constitutionalist. And I feel like a lot of constitutionalists, especially around that time, I'm, I'm only, I'm 29. I'm like four years younger than you. So we're probably pr pretty much come from a lot of places. And I'm actually originally from Maine as well. So um, we're both from originally from New England. I mean, I, I was a country boy because Maine's country, but I digress. Point I'm getting at is uh, I kind of came from like the right in a sense. And my family was like kind of in between neocon and constitutionalists. And it's sounding like you were kind of there as well. Like they weren't full on neo neocons. They weren't full on constitutionalists. They were kind of that kind of generic, you know, like what you, you know, the generic conservative essentially where they're kind of falling between somewhere. Would that yeah, be you, yeah. you or am I off? No, like no. Up that's, that's your upbringing, right. I mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's pretty accurate. Um, you, you know, by and large, they were, my family was all uh, mostly Republicans. My father's side was all Democrats. My mother's side was all Republicans. My immediate family were like much more conservative. I was, um, like I said, I was always like a constitutionalist, and like I, that always led me to support right wing candidates. Um, and then I remember when George Bush did the whole "No Child Left Behind" thing, I was like, you know what? There's just sort of a light bulb went off. I was like, wow, these guys are not small government people. So there's something up here, right? When "No Child Left Behind" hit, I was like. My, I, I've wanted to get rid of the Department of Education at this point, right? That was part of the Republican Party's platform throughout the 90s was to abolish the DOE. Nowadays, they, they, they're funding the DOE. They're giving them increases in funding. But at the time, they, it was part of the platform was that they opposed the DOE. And all of a sudden, you have George Bush come in reverse course and just blow it out of proportion and give it this huge budget and expand its powers. And I really felt betrayed. And that's what sort of led me to... Uh, look for alternatives and then of course there was a 2008 financial crisis and this sort of confluence of events that sort of led me to spot ron paul at the debates and i was like that guy's actually making a lot of sense you know like i'm supposed to think he's crazy but he's making a lot of friggin sense and that's that's when i like i said that's when i started researching it okay cool i was just kind of trying to figure out kind of where you came from because it seemed like I don't know, also I, all right i'll back up a little bit i kind of want to know a little bit about your parents specifically because they seem, it seemed like our family are very similar and I'm not saying, I'm not trying to trash my mom, not that she even watches this, but, or my, or my, my dad either, but they were kind of the generic, you know, conservatives. And I did, I guess I feel like growing up, I kind of felt like I had a certain path to go down to, but it seems like your family is very different, but yet they're very similar the same way. Were they just more like a free, you know, do whatever you want kind of deal or, you know, cause it seemed like you were kind of just a, or maybe you were just that much of a free spirit. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just kind of curious yeah, I was, how your parents you know, were essentially. My 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 parents were like, you know, uh, sort of blue blooded, uh, you know, flag waving Americans, sort of, you know, the normal sort of run of the mill sort of statist. Probably more conservative than anything, but you know, they could, they would go both ways when when they had to. Um, I think they were both registered members of the Republican Party. Now, my father is like a diehard Republican, and so is my mother, but. Uh, at the time, they were a little bit more liberal. I was always like a like a, I would go my own way. Like I, I had no problem, you know, disagreeing with anybody at any time. But I just happened to be, like I said, small government. And the Republicans at the time, at least, they were portraying themselves as the party of small government. You know, back in the '90s, Newt Gingrich got you know a balanced budget passed. Like that's unheard of today. Congress would never do something like this. So like there was still like life. There was still a little. There was still a pulse left of the small government uh, wing of politics, I guess at that point, but it was, you know, obviously it was dying and now it's completely dead. So, um, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, I was just trying to get a feel of what your family was like because our family sound very similar. I mean, mine probably a little bit more rural than yours were because you were more in a, like a city uh, type thing, I'm assuming. Uh, and yeah. So let's move on and let's do like a, okay, we, we're at like college. Let's uh, let's see what your – if you're a constitutionalist at this time. Uh, let, let's walk, walk me through – because, I mean, you, you, shit, you have like a shitload of degrees, don't you? But I'm assuming at some point you stopped going to university. You weren't doing university life anymore, right? You were yeah, right. Over, or sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I was going to um, Seton Hall and in like 2007, seven, eight, something like that. And this is when I started to become like more libertarian-ish and like more stated libertarian. And I was, you know, like I said, I was becoming like a small government sort of libertarian. I was going to party meetings and stuff like that. And... Uh, which was an absolute disaster that helped me see later on what a joke the libertarian party is because uh, i saw it from the inside out and uh right about at this time i'm like i'm listening to the tom woods show a lot at this point and I, I never really wanted to be um one of these crazy anarchists you know right? i didn't want to be one of these wacky anarchists because who's going to take you seriously if you're an anarchist right that's crazy and uh I was a big history nerd. Like I'm still, I still am. I've always been a big history, like sort of guy. Like I can read like a million history books in a week. I just, I can't get enough of it. And Tom Woods, uh, who's a historian for any of the listeners out there who are unfamiliar with him, you, you should familiarize yourself with him because the man's absolutely brilliant. And he's got probably the best damn podcast that I can think of. And uh, one day he's talking about this great historian that he knows of named Ralph Rako. So I'm like, all right, well, you know, if it's good enough for Woods, it's good enough for me. Hey, go home. And I look up some Ralph Rako books, and I'm starting to watch some Ralph Rako YouTube lectures. And he's a history professor and whatnot, and this guy is brilliant. And he's got this sort of, like, grandfatherly vibe to him. Like, I, I don't know, I just, like, really connected with him. I, I, I got the impression, like, clearly this man is not wacky, right? This guy's clearly not crazy. He's a normal sort of dude that you could see, you know, at, at your Thanksgiving dinner table. So, and he's an anarchist. So that really gave me the confidence to accept the, the term anarchist. And he was friends with uh, Murray Rothbard and Leonard Legio. That's why I was like, all right, you know, let me check out those guys too. And once I saw, uh, you know, my first Rothbard lecture, then it was all over. And then at that point, you know, burn it down. <laughs> you know, once you see Rothbard, it's a whole different, your perception of the world is never the same. Was that your moment? Did you, when the first lecture when you decided because like I said earlier, my moment was reading Anatomy of the State. That was when I was like, I'm an anarchist. Because I was a fence sitter for a long time on the minarchy anarchy thing, like a long, long time. And I listened to Dave Smith for like ever, like, because that's kind of like where I got a lot of that education, like more anarchy and cap education. And it was, wasn't, was he yeah. always was going on about Anatomy of the State. And I finally read it. And I probably listened to Dave for like probably at least a couple of years before I finally did. And then once I read Anatomy of State. I mean, listening, it's funny, listening to Dave for like years didn't do it, but like just right. reading Anatomy of State, I was like, yep. <laughs> yeah. Rothbard, that, that, that's, yeah. that's why Rothbard is so powerful. That's why, that's one of the first books I recommend to people is Anatomy of the State. But uh, no, actually, I, I can, I watched these Reiko lectures and Leonard Legio's lectures and uh, Rothbard lectures, and I still wasn't, I was still sort of like not fully there. And then I, this one um, particular lecture that Rothbard gave, I think it's called, um, you can look it up on YouTube, it's called like, How I Became a Libertarian or something like that. And he tells the story of, you know, I'm sure you're familiar, he, he used to have all these brilliant minds in his living room to, to, to discuss philosophy until like, you know, three, four o'clock in the morning, it would be him and Walter Block and you know, all these brilliant folks, uh, these names that we all know, they would be discussing these ideas in his living room late at night. And uh, he had these liberals, these these leftists there one night to discuss and philosophize with him. And he said to him, the liberals said to him, well, you know, Murray, uh, you know, why not privatize the police? And this is when Murray was a minarchist. And he said to them, oh, you know, that's crazy. You can't do that. And he gave him some run-of-the-mill answer. And he started thinking to himself. He said, later on, when they went home, it, it sort of hit me. Hey, you know, they're right. They, they were right. They had a point. I was being logically inconsistent. And uh, Rothbard said, from that point on, I was an anarchist. And I thought to myself, you know what? I, I, I can't uh, think of any reason why the police shouldn't be privatized. So... I also must be an anarchist then, you know, and that's when I sort of 
really came into my own. That's when I sort of like accepted everything and like really developed full force into like full on agorist or, or full on anarchism at this point. I wasn't an agorist yet. I was just a pure end cap Rothbardian. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, like uh, like I said, it was anatomy of state for me. But it's like the the what did it was because anatomy of state just pokes so many holes because everyone has this idea. Like minarchist is like you know like oh if we just go back to the constitution or whatever, and it's like you know it's kind of the, and at the end of the day it, I always boil anatomy of state you know down to like you know kind of almost in a way kind of you know the the meme where it's like you know you have the uppercase and lowercase letters kind of saying it stupid like oh if we just had you know, better people and that did better things, and you're supposed, but you don't. So it's like, you know, like it kind of points out how the whole system is just flawed. Like even the most perfect system that you possibly can envision is just flawed. Like at the end of the day, you're just like, you're, it's a systemic problem. And it's like, you can't just like, just be like, well, if better people are there, but it's like, but the system is set up for better people to not be there. <laughs> any, uh, any, any sort of writing from Rothbard uh, carries a punch to it, but Anatomy of the State is, is, is a knockout punch. That's certainly probably his most powerful piece of writing, I think. Yeah, it definitely did it for me, because I was like, like I said, yeah. I, but I was on the fence, so I was like, I guess I, in a sense, too, is also I was just looking for that, like, I don't know, it was like, logically, everything was making sense, but like, some part of my brain which is like no no you can't like because i guess just just that like i don't know the fucking the brainwashing essentially of like you know american yeah, life exactly <laughs> and tom wood said it best he said that the state's greatest victory was um convincing people to fear the term anarchy and love the term government and that's sort of the sort of battle that i was stuck in that's sort of what was holding me back and it sounds like you know you were sort of dealing with something similar yeah it's like you almost like you just it's more of a letting go thing because you're just like it's like I logically completely understand why right. it's like I can't even provide really a good reason. It's just that it's like well you just you just can't. <laughs> it's as simple as this, really. If you think about it, um, if, if if you know if you can't answer the question, the following question, then you're an anarchist. What goods or services does the state provide us with which the market is unable to provide at both a cheaper cost and a higher quality? Right. If the answer is nothing, then you have then you're an anarchist. If you yeah. think there is something, if you think that there is something that the state can provide at a cheaper cost and a higher quality, then you're an economic illiterate. That's that that's the difference. Yeah. Okay. Where were we at? We kind of we kind of went off a tangent there, but I mean, I enjoyed it. Obviously, we were at uh, you uh, kind of your you were probably like what like early twenties. So let's uh let's move to like kind of I guess more closer to where we are now, like mid twenties, late twenties. Kind of where where were we at around that time? I mean, at that time, I'm assuming so, you're kind of getting established doing your doing your fucking thing, you know? Yeah, so about I, I, around 2015, I found um, – I, I was familiar with agorism before this, but in around 2015, 2014, I think it was actually, I went to uh, Porkfest in New Hampshire. So that was about six years ago, almost seven years ago. Uh, I went to Porkfest in New Hampshire, and this was like a really uh, formative, like, experience for me because I saw, you know, I, I had Bitcoin at this time and Bitcoin was obviously much cheaper and I, I had a bunch of Bitcoin, but for the first time I saw people trading Bitcoin for goods and services at Porkfest for food you were paying in cryptocurrency or silver coins. Um, I attended seminars on 3D printing and aquaponics. It's where I learned about 3D printing for the first time. So really, this is where I learned how to live as an anarchist rather than just think like an anarchist. So the, that was a real life-changing moment for me. And that really led me to get into aquaponics and cryptocurrencies and precious metals and 3D printing. And that sort of turned me into what I am now, right? And then shortly after that, um, I found uh, Sam Konkin in Agorism, and I was... Uh, just blown blown away by the extreme logical consistency like it was sort of like levels of astonishment like when i found ron paul i was like wow this guy is much more consistent than the republican party and then i found um you know uh rothbard and i'm like wow that guy is so much more consistent than the small l libertarians you know and then i found Konkin, and i was like whoa this guy He's he has it. He has it nailed down. Like this is the this is the Picasso. This is the masterpiece. Like we found like the holy grail of uh, of the social sciences, right? You know, the other way to look at it is like I went to school for for political science. I had a 
bachelor's degree, I had a master's degree. And finally, like, like you, you, you see the theory, like you find the theory that like does it for you, you know? It's almost like when Stephen Hawking found like the theory of black hole, right? It's like, that was what it was like for, like, for me when I like first read Konkin. And that's when I knew like, Look at like I, like I said, I was already familiar with three D printing and cryptocurrencies. That's when Konkin sort of tied it all together for me. It showed me the power of it all, and uh, here we are today. Yeah, it's funny. I, it's funny. We're like literally on the same path. It was Ron Paul, Mothbard, and, and Konkin that were like my, you know, like those were my sweethearts. You know, like those are the ones who had those special moments. You know, I mean, honestly, I think like a lot of people. The, yeah, and so, Rothbard was probably the most impactful because I think something about that minergist to anarchist shift is kind of like, uh, you know, in a, in a weird way, the most important. And then it seemed like that, like, agorism one was almost like a, a fine-tuning my direction in a sense, you know? Yeah, so, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I think that's a good way of putting it, too, because, uh, you know, there's a big, you know, you, when you go from minarchist to anarchist, you're going from socialist to capitalist. When you go from ANCAP to agorist, you're going from capitalist to uh, high functioning capitalist, right? Like that, that's basically the difference. Yeah, that consistent capitalist. Yeah, in the true true yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So we're you're, we're at that 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 point about like mid to late twenties. So let's get to where you're at now. What 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 is what is uh, Sal doing these days? What 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 projects are you working on? Well, now. Um, Geez, well, I, I started a, a agoristics, um, which is really mainly designed to help spread the mass adoption of cryptocurrencies. And we just, the point is we just sort of, we're trying to uh, do any, we're, we'll undertake any project that we think can help spread cryptocurrencies. But the point is to sort of make it easier for people to buy and sell things and normal goods and services. So one project we have is uh, 3D printer Go Burr where we're selling 3D printers and stuff for cryptocurrency and it sort of helps people uh, work around the sort of KYC payment platforms that they would normally use. So that's really taking up a lot of my time. I do a lot of blogging and uh, affiliate marketing, content marketing. Um, I'm pretty active on social media, on Twitter. I run a meme page, Salvi Agorist. I run another meme page on Facebook when, they're, when I'm not banned or in Facebook jail <laughs> called uh, Print Guns Not Money. I host the Agora podcast <clears throat> about uh, Agor's theory and counter economics. I also co-host uh, Unloose the Goose with a bunch of great agorists every Wednesday. I missed today, actually. I missed a little bit earlier. So they're going to be mad at me when they see me on this show. Uh, <laughs> I know I was thinking but, that uh, earlier <laughs> when I was watching but, it. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm staying busy, that's for sure. And I'm, I'm, we're at an agorist, we're always expanding and we're starting new companies and not all of them succeed, but not all of them fail. Some are more successful than others. So we're always, uh, I'm, I'm always staying busy. I do a lot of blogging too for agorist nexus, newlibertarian.io. And also at 3D Printer Go Burr, we have a blog about 3D printing. So uh, I don't have, really have enough time in the day to do everything that I need to do. Uh, so I'm certainly staying busy and I'm really thankful and blessed because, you know, one of the things I said to Pete Canones recently when we were chatting was like, you know, Sam's dream was always to make a living as uh, like a, as an, as an agorist, as a counter economist. And now if you look at how many people are actually doing it, it's really wild, right? Like people are making full-time incomes like myself and Jack Spierko and Pete Canones and Vin Armani and like, all these folks are, are, are doing this in a full-time basis, and it's incredible to see how far agorism has come in the last 15 years. It just blows my mind. Uh, it's just a shame that Sam wasn't around to see it, you know. Neil would, Neil was around to see the end of it. The, you know, it's just he died a, a couple of years ago, so he did see a little bit of it, which makes me happy. But, man, it's incredible how far we've come, and I think it's incredible how far we're going to be in another 15 years. Yeah, it is cool because it is like that's one thing I've thought about a few times where it's like, I mean, Konkin is like kind of newer because I don't remember when he wrote NLM. It was kind of what was it like late 80s, early 90s, something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Around, that, around that time. But like, it's like I think a lot. I mean, I'm not sure where he died either. Do you remember when he died? Uh, just real quick. 2004, uh, Sam died. 
So like 2004, it's kind of like, yes, it feels like he's a newer philosopher or whatever you want to call him. And he kind of was. At the same time, he still was gone before we really hit those things that would really be like, this is super agoric or whatever you want to call it. You know, like, I mean, there's some yeah. more like the beating sages, but like, you know, between C it's setting, Bitcoin, quickly. 3D printers, all that, you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's incredible how quickly he has... Um sort of been elevated into like with the high ranking philosophers like the, like you know people tell you to study Rothbard and Proudhon and uh, you know Marx and you want to read all these lunatics and stuff like that and for better or worse and Conkin's right up there with that with all of them and of course in my mind he's you know the, the smartest of all of them he, he was the one who got it right but you know I, I think he it's well deserved the place that he's earned for himself so quickly you know yeah, and one thing you brought up before that I thought was kind of smart, and I, what I've told a lot of people when it comes to Konkin, I don't ever really suggest Konkin. This is actually something I got from you from, I don't remember what it was, like one of your podcasts or what. I don't ever suggest him unless it's somebody who's already like an ANCAP. It's kind of like, because it's kind of the whole idea of the remnant, and I can consider like Konkin being people who are the remnant of the remnant. If you're one of them, then like you should probably read Konkin, and it's like, like it's, you need to be already yeah. like a hardcore ANCAP before you're ready to embrace the ideas of Konkin in my eyes. And that's something from something I heard you say in one of your podcasts before, and it really clicked. I was like, yeah, you're totally fucking right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you know, your normal uh, Libertarian Party member, you're not going to get somebody from the you know, Republican Liberty Caucus to all of a sudden support, uh, you know, so taking down the Federal Reserve with you know sound money alternatives. They're not going to they're not going to do that. They want to. They want to subsist the Federal Reserve so they can pay for their warfare state. So, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, and I think I, Sam said that. He, he said that, you know, why waste your time and effort trying to convince somebody who's not going to, uh, you just, you know, who, who clearly isn't there yet. Focus on people, you know, the more radical end caps the ones who are almost there, they're one step away from agorism and sort of show them the door. You can't make a, a horse walk through the door, but you can show it, show it to them, you know? Yeah. I mean, and it's also too, it's always funny. Like if you do try to tell these ideas, which I've kind of felt victim to, like, you know, like people are just generic Republicans or, or Democrats. They're just gonna be like, what you want me to sell blow to, to undermine the state? Like, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I know. Well, that's the other thing, too, that we combat is that we have that sort of uh, they think that we're sort of like street urchins, I guess, which in a sense, they're not completely incorrect. Right. There is certain, certainly that element of agorism, but that's not it's it's it's, it's based in, in sound philosophy and theory. And I think that's the part that a lot of people miss. Yeah. No, I, all right. Well, we're probably at a good point to go ahead and do plugs and stuff. Uh, I mean, I had a lot of fun with this. Uh, I know you kind of promised one of your buddies you you wanted to go you, you were gonna be hanging out here soon so and we're right about that time and we're kind of like right at the perfect spot in the conversation although I am having fun with this and I'd like to keep going but we'll we'll go ahead and do that here we're at the perfect spot anyway so uh, you, do you have any other plugs you want to drop we kind of like the last little bit kind of was plugs but a little bit like an informal version of plugs if you will so I don't know if you want to go yeah yeah. Um... That's basically it. Other than that, uh, the only other thing I can tell people is to check out SaviAgris.com or SaviAgris.com. That's where I, uh, you know, sort of update everything and keep my podcasts and blog posts. And uh, I, I sell T-shirts and all stuff. So uh, check out SaviAgris.com also. Cool. Uh, yeah, um, I'll do my plugs real quick. Uh, like, like I always say, uh, we'll put all his. If you just send me when you get a chance. Send me your stuff, and we'll I'll throw it in, uh, throw it in the video description. But my stuff and your stuff, put it all in the video description. Uh, uh, just recently, I added. Uh, I'm on the podcast audio podcast now. Just this show, the the No Way Jose. Uh, wasn't able to really figure out how to do the other shows. Uh, we also on the Liberty Movement YouTube channel. We we added the Last Nighters, who they have their own YouTube channel as well. Go check them out. Um, you if you go to go to subscribe to them instead of just you know following them on this channel, you'll be able to get like more like up to date content because we don't we like wait about a week before we upload their stuff. That way we're not we're not jacking their jacking their new stuff. And uh, also they have like a huge library of shit. They do uh they do uh, reviews of movies kind of from a, a libertarian perspective. They also have the actual anarchy one where they go more deep into the libertarian perspective. And they kind of like, you know, they go more political. Essentially, the idea is the last nighters is supposed to be supposed to be more like suited for normies. Essentially, if you want to be able to share that to your normie friends and kind of be like, hey, uh, you know, here's this movie I know you like, you know, you, you, here's a review of it. And they kind of drop little subtle hints of, uh, you know, libertarianism in there. Uh, we also got the Liberty Movement Facebook group. We're on MeWe now. 
Um, the the YouTube we also got our YouTube set up on library BitChute. We also got the email the Liberty Movement Global at gmail.com. Uh, we're also, you know, if you're hearing this right now, send me an email. We're trying to set up an email list. So every email we get, we throw in the email list. Uh, we need to get it more official and set up like an actual like email list thing. But we're, I'm kind of a tech idiot. So, you know, I'm working with what we got. Uh, so send it to me. Uh, we're trying to get here. We're trying to collect all the emails we can. And we're going to set up a website here soon and or a newsletter. You know, that's something we've been trying to work on for a while. We also got the merch. Uh, you know, you see me drinking that cup. I also mentioned, uh, to Sal that we have the Florida chapter ones. We have all sorts of stuff. That'll be in the bottom in the video description, all the merch. So like I said, they have the chapters there too. So there's the Florida flag with the end cap thing behind it. Uh, yeah. Like, share, subscribe, comment, do all that good shit. Uh, and with that, deuce, it's been great having you, May, uh, Mayweather. Why do I just call you Mayweather? Sal, fucking weird. But <laughs> yeah. No worries, brother. No, thanks yeah. for having me. And I appreciate it. And hey, man, I had a blast. Let's do this again. Yeah, no, I really had a fun time. And then the, the idea of this episode was that we could set the groundwork for later later talks. So, because I could Absolutely. see. Absolutely. Especially when I'm a tech idiot. I kind of was like, I see possibility of a lot of episodes here. <laughs> so, how, how do I uh, open Excel? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just kidding. I'm not that hopefully bad. Hopefully sooner but. than later. Hopefully <laughs> sooner than later we can, we can do it. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely, I almost was tempted because I want to do one on crypto because I still haven't even gone into crypto, which is like a shame because it's like, Everything about crypto is like right up my alley, but it's just the tech thing that's like I don't fucking know. <laughs> yeah, I've heard well, it really here. Well, I'm here, brother. <laughs> yeah, so I figured we'd probably maybe here soon, probably do like a crypto for dummies episode. And by dummies, I mean me. Shoot me a DM, <laughs> yeah. Shoot me a DM and, we'll, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take it down. Yeah. All right, I'll let you go, man. This has been really fun. <laughs> All right. We'll Thank see you, it. brother. All right, we'll see you, man. Bye.